welcome back guys now in this video let's discuss about ectopic pregnancy guys what exactly is ectopic pregnancy ectopic pregnancy means implantation and development of embryo happening outside the uterine cavity okay actually implantation should be happening in the uterine cavity what happens if embryo is growing outside the uterine cavity that is in the ectopic location such kind of pregnancies are called as ectopic pregnancies now let's see some important direct single liners from the topic of ectopic pregnancy what's the most common site of ectopic is it fallopian tubes or ovaries guys always remember fallopian tubes are the most common sites for the ectopic now comes the question in the fallopian tubes there are different parts like interstitium isthmus ampulla infundibulum fimbrillant now out of all these parts which part of fallopian tube is most likely to have an ectopic pregnancy it is ampullary region also remember that ampulla is the most common site of fertilization okay ampulla is the most common site of fertilization and ampulla is the most common site of ectopic pregnancy also which type of ectopic tubal ectopic okay so most common site of ectopic is fallopian tubes now if someone ask you what is the most common non tubal site of ectopic which means other than fallopian tubes or after fallopian tubes what is the most common site the most common site is ovaries okay now what is the least common site of ectopic it is a c section scar or cervical ectopics are least common now please concentrate here the most common site of ectopic is fallopian tube even in the fallopian tube ampulla is the most common site followed by isthmus infundibulum and interstitium now most common non tubal site of ectopic is ovary which means in the ovary baby is growing you can clearly see here that a baby is growing in the ovary that's a ovarian ectopic now least common site of ectopic is a c section scar or cervical ectopic now here what you can see is these are the fallopian tube okay this is the fallopian tube inside the fallopian tube a baby is growing now guys if a baby is growing outside the uterine cavity that is for example in the adnexa okay uh, in the fallopian tubes if you do ultrasonography what kind of appearance you will get what kind of signs you will get see please concentrate here there is this ring of fire appearance okay if you do doppler ultrasonography you can see this like you know all this uh, ring appearance is nothing but a placental like you know uh, placental blood okay placental blood which is forming around the gestational sac this is a ring of fire appearance which is seen with the ectopic pregnancy in the adnexa and this ring of fire appearance is also seen with the corpus luteal cyst okay uh, more common than the ectopics corpus corpus luteal cysts which are more common and even in the corpus luteal cyst you can see such kind of ring of fire appearance okay now after this let's talk a few points about a coronal pregnancy what exactly is coronal pregnancy guys for example if this is a uterus we all know that there are these regions called as a cornua okay so the angle of uterus this region is a cornua if implantation happens in the area of cornua in the region of cornua See, this coronal region is also known as interstitial part of the fallopian tube now can i call coronal pregnancy as ectopic pregnancy yes absolutely you can call it why because see implantation is happening in the interstitial part of the fallopian tube so definitely it is outside the uterine cavity but what exactly is angular pregnancy angular pregnancy is actually intrauterine pregnancy happens near the angle of the uterus okay it's in the uterine cavity only but this implantation is happening near the angle of the uterus so angular pregnancy is intrauterine pregnancy coronal pregnancy is a type of ectopic pregnancy now what exactly is heterotropic pregnancy heterotropic pregnancy means see there is one pregnancy happening inside the uterine cavity and the other is happening outside the uterine cavity so a combination of intrauterine pregnancy as well as ectopic pregnancy is termed as heterotropic pregnancy and usually these heterotropic pregnancies are because of the assisted reproductive methods like in vitro fertilization 
okay so you are uh, going to release a lot of embryos and one such embryo is going to lodge in the uterine cavity and one embryo got into the fallopian tubes and there it got implanted so because of uh, in vitro fertilization and releasing of a ovum into the uterine cavity you are going to release a 3-4 ovum so one ovum not one ovum I should say one embryo is getting implanted in the uterine cavity one outside the uterine cavity causing heterotropic pregnancy okay well and good now let's see the criteria for different ectopic pregnancies okay for diagnosing different ectopic pregnancies there are certain criterias which are usually shown up as mcqs in your exam that's the reason why we are discussing now let's talk about criteria for ectopic pregnancy guys there are different different types of ectopic pregnancy like abdominal cervical ovarian now to put the diagnosis of different types of ectopic pregnancy there are different criterias for example in abdominal ectopic what actually i mean by abdominal ectopic ectopic pregnancy happening in the abdominal cavity that is on the intestines so i used to remember something like abs 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 means that a six pack muscles right so ab abdominal ectopic it have the criteria which starts with the s that is studford criteria okay so please concentrate studford's criteria is for abdominal ectopic cervical ectopic see cervical ectopic starts with the letter c c p r Okay, so cervical ectopic, the criteria for diagnosis is Palman or Rubin's criteria. Now, if I am talking about ovarian ectopic, see, ovarian means ova. Ova all the time wants to meet with the sperm. So, ovarian ectopic, the mnemonic for criteria is Spiegelsberg criteria. So, let's have a recap of all the points which we have discussed. Please concentrate. Carnival pregnancy is the pregnancy happening in the carnival part of the uterus. That's in the interstitial part of the fallopian tube, I can say. So, it's a type of ectopic pregnancy. Okay. Angular pregnancy is a normal intrauterine pregnancy happens near the carnival or happens near to the angle of the uterus, but still it's a normal intrauterine pregnancy. Now, what exactly is heterotropic pregnancy? Heterotropic pregnancy means one intrauterine pregnancy plus one ectopic pregnancy. Now, see what are the criteria, guys for abdominal ectopic, Studiford's criteria, cervical ectopic, Palman or Rubin's criteria and ovarian ectopic it is Spiegelsberg criteria. So, criteria are completed. Now, let's see what are the risk factors of ectopic pregnancy. The very important risk factor is a previous tubal surgeries or previous history of ectopic. Okay, please concentrate like you know on this uh, things which are having this Q mark. Okay, they are very very important. Previous history of an ectopic pregnancy is a risk factor for ectopic pregnancy in this current pregnancy also. Okay, previous history of ectopic, there is a lot of chance that the next pregnancy can be an ectopic pregnancy. Or previous tubal surgeries, okay, see this previous tubal surgery may cause constrictions in the fallopian tube, may cause obstructions in the fallopian tube so that the embryo is not able to come into the uterine cavity. So, embryo is getting implanted in the fallopian tube itself for example see if this is the fallopian tube if it's got constricted in this area okay because of adhesions or whatever the reason so that the embryo is unable to enter into the uterine cavity it is unable to enter so that it's getting implanted here itself so previous history of tubal surgeries endometriosis is a risk factor why endometriosis is a risk factor of ectopic, ectopic pregnancy why? because endometriosis is a condition where Endometrium is growing outside the uterine cavity. Embryo should implant on the endometrium. But if embryo finds endometrium in some other place, there it can get implants. For example, in endometriosis, okay, in endometriosis, what's happening? Uh, these endometrial implants are going to fall onto the ovaries. So that now this ectopic pregnancy can simply implant on the endometrium which is present on the ovary. Okay, right? So this embryo can simply implant on the ovary this ovary ovarian surface is having endometrium so this embryo can simply implant over there okay so endometriosis is a risk factor genital tuberculosis a sexually transmitted diseases or pelvic inflammatory disease genital infections is a risk factor for ectopic pregnancy why usually in genital tuberculosis or pelvic inflammatory disease in all these conditions the most common structure that's going to be affected is fallopian tubes if fallopian tubes are affected means they will develop these adhesions because of those adhesions the fallopian tubes getting narrowed 
they are going to get this dips and all the things so that embryo can simply implant in those pits embryo is unable to enter into the uterine cavity so that implantation happen in the fallopian tubes that's going to cause ectopic pregnancy okay now multiple sexual partners see multiple sexual partners is going to cause sexually transmitted diseases okay having multiple sexual partners it can lead to sexually transmitted diseases in sexually transmitted diseases fallopian tubes will be affected so salpingitis can be there salpingitis is a risk factor for ectopic pregnancy okay now in the smokers and iv drug abusers if a female is a smoker definitely because of smoking her immune system is going to go down so that she is more likely to get the infections if at all there is a, this genital infection fallopian tubes will be affected that causes ectopic pregnancy yes we have discussed now even low socioeconomic status means low immunity low immunity means more chances of infection more chances of infection means more chances of genital infections also fallopian tubes are affected chances of ectopic pregnancy yes contraceptive failure guys this is a very important point i want you to concentrate this one important mcq okay this one important risk factor why see for example there is this contraception failure imagine that there is this female who is having intrauterine copper device or intrauterine contraceptive device now for example this intrauterine contraceptive device is mirena progesterone releasing intrauterine contraceptive device now having such intrauterine contraceptive device she shouldn't become pregnant by chance if she become pregnant this pregnancy will more likely to end up as ectopic pregnancy why even in the topic of contraception i have clearly explained but still i will take a moment and i will explain here also guys see if i am talking about okay let me right here if i am talking about intrauterine contraceptive device that is progesterone releasing intrauterine contraceptive device that is a mirena for example what it is actually doing it is keep on releasing the progesterone now because of this progesterones what happens the fallopian tubes are going to be relaxed okay the peri like no we all know that fallopian tubes will be having this peristaltic action but under the effect of progesterone the fallopian tubes will be relaxed because progesterone is a smooth muscle relaxant now if fertilization happens means what happens see there is this fertilized let me show you here see this is a fallopian tube now here is the ova sperm is going to meet with the ova there is fertilization happened now you are going to have a embryo here now to move this embryo from the fallopian tube into the uterine cavity you need to have this peristaltic actions but there is this intrauterine uh, intrauterine uh, progesterone releasing agent or intrauterine progesterone releasing contraceptive device it's keep on releasing the progesterones under the effect of progesterones the smooth muscles of fallopian tubes are relaxed so that no peristaltic movement as there is no peristaltic movement the embryo is going to get implant in the fallopian tubes itself that leads to ectopic pregnancy so contraceptive failure remember i am not saying presence of intrauterine contraceptive device increases the risk of ectopic pregnancy i am not saying that what i am saying is failure of intrauterine contraceptive device or failure of contraceptives like progesterone releasing pills progesterone injections progesterone implants failure of those contraceptives will increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy okay that's a very very important point and in utero exposure to dithyl silvestrol guys dithyl silvestrol we have already studied it's going to it's going to cause mullerian anomalies mullerian anomalies are going to cause they might associate with endometriosis yes endometriosis is a risk factor for ectopic pregnancy we have studied right yes so in utero exposure to dithyl silvestrol it causes mullerian anomalies and that mullerian anomalies can cause ectopic pregnancies true okay so intrauterine contraceptive device failure progesterone only pills okay she is on the progesterone only pills now these pills fail 
so that there is this pregnancy now this pregnancy more likely to be end up as ectopic pregnancy or failure of tubectomy okay tubal surgeries failure of this tubal surgeries may also cause ectopic pregnancies okay these are very important risk factors now after seeing risk factors let's see what happens if at all there is an ectopic guys if at all there is an ectopic there can be two fates okay there are two options either this ectopic is simply going to abort right because you need to have a viable environment that is a uterine cavity in uterine cavity you can expect a embryo to grow but if there is embryo outside the uterine cavity most of the time it's going to abort so that is a tubal abortion and tubal abortion is going to be most commonly happening in the ampulla region see there is one more fate known as a tubal rupture okay ectopic growing inside the fallopian tube now this ectopic it is growing okay it's not getting aborted as it's growing it will cause stretching of the fallopian tube there is one moment that it ruptures the fallopian tube and there is so much severe bleeding okay so tubal rupture the most common site is going to be isthmus okay the most common site of tubal abortion is ampulla most common site of tubal rupture is isthmus okay now let's see a few important points guys tubal ectopic ends earliest in guys inside the fallopian tube there is this ectopic now there are many parts of fallopian tube if ectopic is happening in isthmus region there this ectopic cannot grow what does i mean by if there is tubal ectopic which is present in the isthmus this ectopic won't last longer it's going to get died okay so that's a very important point tubal ectopic ends earliest in the isthmus but tubal ectopic with the longest survival period is seen in interstitial part of the fallopian tube why because please concentrate if this is a uterus this is a fallopian tube this part is the interstitial part of the fallopian tube this interstitial part of the fallopian tube is in close proximity to the endometrium and uterine cavity so that in this region also because of the endometrial uh, supplement and endometrial nutrition here you can expect a baby to grow for longer duration ectopic to grow for a longer duration so tubal ectopic with longer longest survival period is seen with the interstitial guys the keyword is tubal ectopic with longest survival period but what is that ectopic with overall guys overall ectopic with a longest survival period is abdominal ectopic which means ectopic pregnancy or this baby growing on the intestines see here what you can see is baby is not inside the uterine cavity okay baby is not in the uterine cavity baby is growing on the intestines okay baby is growing in the abdominal cavity so this is abdominal ectopic and you can have a normal viable baby sometimes okay uh, no i am not saying like you know every time there will be a normal viable baby but it is possible for a baby to grow till 9 months that is abdominal ectopic can last till term okay that's the longest survival ectopic abdominal ectopic now after this let's see the clinical features guys out of the entire topic this slide is going to be the most important slide why because without mentioning these three clinical features okay these are known as a triad of ectopic without mentioning these three clinical features they won't ask a clinical question on ectopic pregnancy okay so what are the clinical features ectopic pregnancy is also pregnancy right yes definitely it's a pregnancy so definitely there is this amenorrhea also they will mention this amenorrhea for 6 to 10 weeks this period is important usually amenorrhea of 6 to 10 weeks most of the time they will mention amenorrhea for 8 weeks okay in most of the questions they will mention this word there is a female present to the clinic with 8 weeks of amenorrhea and this amenorrhea period can be somewhere between 6 to 10 weeks okay after amenorrhea there is pain in the abdomen why there is pain in the abdomen why because these fallopian tubes are getting stretched so because of the stretching of the fallopian tubes or due to rupture of the fallopian tubes there is this pain in the abdomen a female present to the clinic with a complaint of pain in the abdomen and amenorrhea for 8 weeks okay well and good now 
Apart from these two symptoms, there is also pervaginal bleeding or pervaginal spotting. For example, if there is a rupture of fallopian tube, there is so much bleeding, now she is hemodynamically unstable. Either she can simply present with pervaginal bleeding or pervaginal spotting or she can be taken to the department with shock, hemodynamically unstable patient. So, there can be pervaginal bleeding or if there is a ruptured ectopic, patient may also present with the shock. So, what are the triad symptoms of ectopic pregnancy? Amenorrhea, pain in abdomen, pervaginal bleeding. These three are triad of ectopic pregnancy. Now, let me tell you one thing. See, this ectopic pregnancy is happening 8 weeks. Just 8 weeks. What, what exactly I mean by? See, what I am trying to put into your mind is, even this female doesn't know that she is a pregnant. And you doesn't know that she is a pregnant. Because she is just 8 weeks of, like you know, she is just away 8 weeks from her last menstrual period. Which means you doesn't know that she is a pregnant and she doesn't know that she is a pregnant. Now, amenorrhea in a reproductive age female, you have to suspect urine pregnancy test. So, just tell me whether this urine pregnancy test is going to come positive or negative. Definitely, it will be positive only. Okay. So, these are the keywords. Amenorrhea for 6 to 10 weeks. Pain in abdomen. Pervaginal bleeding. What you have done? You have suspected that this is ectopic pregnancy and you have ordered urine pregnancy test and it came positive okay most of the time the examiner is asking you about ectopic pregnancy only okay now let's see what are the clinical features guys we have seen the clinical features if you do um, pv examination okay pervaginal examination there is bulged posterior vaginal fornix due to accumulation of blood in the pouch of Douglas. See, whenever the fallopian tube got ruptured, there is so much of amount of bleeding. These, all this bleeding is getting accumulated in that one particular area, which is known as the pouch of Douglas. So, whenever you do pervaginal examination, you can see that bulging of the posterior fornix because of the blood accumulation. Okay, you can, you can go up to pouch of Douglas, right? Which is the posterior vaginal fornix. Now, what are the signs present? See, if it is a ruptured ectopic, there is so much amount of bleeding happening. See, because of this bleeding, there is a referred pain. Okay, this bleeding will irritate the nerve endings. That causes a referred pain. What is that? See, Danforth sign. Danforth sign means pain referred, referral pain to the tip of the shoulder. Now, see. There is this female came to your clinic with a complaint of amenorrhea for the last 8 weeks. Now, she is also having pain in the abdomen, pervaginal bleeding, urine pregnancy test came positive. She also mentions that she have pain in the tip of the shoulders, ectopic pregnancy. What is this pain guys? This is nothing but Danforth sign. See, pain referred to the shoulders during inspiration. Why this is pain? Why? Because so much amount of bleeding happening. Okay, so due to hemoperitoneum and diaphragmatic irritation by the blood. Okay, all this blood is irritating the diaphragm and that causes referred pain. Now, there can be also Cullen sign. What exactly is Cullen sign? Because of this hemorrhage, there can be discoloration around the umbilicus. Hemorrhagic discoloration of the umbilical area due to intraperitoneal hemorrhage of any cause. See, intra peritoneal hemorrhage of any cause can cause this discoloration and even in the ectopic pregnancy also whenever there is a ruptured ectopic because of this hemorrhage you can see this Cullen sign. What are the two signs positive? Cullen sign, Danforth sign. Okay, well and good. Now, this is not needed. Now, what is the gold standard for diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy? It is laparoscopy, visual documentation. See, you can clearly see ectopic pregnancy happening in the fallopian tubes. So, gold standard is laparoscopy. Now, what is the management of ruptured ectopic? There is this female came to you with all the trad of the symptoms. Now, she is in shock. Too much amount of vaginal bleeding. It's confirmed that fallopian tubes are ruptured. Now, what to do? The only management what you can do is, first, first of all, just give her resuscitative measures like you know take care about airway, breathing, circulation, try to replace the blood by blood transfusions and all. That's a normal thing, general resuscitative measures. Apart from that, the main management, the main management is one that is 
salpingectomy take out the fallopian tube okay whatever the fallopian tube where the ectopic is there take out cut down the fallopian tube and throw it out that's it okay salpingectomy via which route laparoscopy or laparotomy see salpingectomy by laparotomy is the surgery of choice mcq okay it doesn't matter whether she is an aliparous female or multiparous female what is the only option if there is a uh, ruptured ectopic take out the tube throw it out via laparotomy not laparoscopy this is the only management of ruptured ectopic see there is ruptured ectopic are you planning for any medical management are you going to stabilize this patient via drugs no now the patient is in shock immediately first do general resuscitative measures followed by salpingectomy via laparotomy now after this let's talk about what if there is unruptured ectopic a female came to you now she is saying eight weeks of amenorrhea now there is abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding but she is hemodynamically stable urine pregnancy test is coming positive now you are suspecting that this is a case of ectopic why why because there is this trad of symptoms now she is in early pregnancy that she even doesn't know that she is a pregnant why because eight weeks just eight weeks eight weeks means almost first two months most of the female doesn't even know that they are pregnant at that time now you have ordered for urine pregnancy test and in 99% of the cases urine pregnancy test is now positive see from now for the next 10 minutes please be attentive each and every word i am speaking is of utmost importance now urine pregnancy test is coming positive now what we have to do perform transvaginal sonography okay if you do transvaginal sonography concentrate on the uterus see if g sac is visible on the uterus okay not on the uterus inside the uterus if you can see g sac inside the uterus it is very simple that this is intra uterine pregnancy and the cause for her symptoms is something totally different okay do exam uh, do investigations accordingly so urine pregnancy test is coming positive you have done the transvaginal sonography if you can see g sac inside the uterus it's okay intra uterine pregnancy is confirmed now please concentrate here guys if uterus is empty okay urine pregnancy test is coming positive you are doing transvaginal sonography uterus is empty now what you have to suspect upt is coming positive but in the uterus you are unable to see the g sac maybe this is a case of ectopic pregnancy so what you have to check the surrounding regions the fallopian tubes ovaries that's the adnexa so what you are doing if uterus is empty think about the ectopic now what you have to do after thinking about ectopic now search the adnexal area okay so you are doing searching in the adnexal region if in adnexal region if you can find fetal cardiac activity if you can see the fetal cardiac activity in the adnexal region it is 100% confirm that this is a case of ectopic pregnancy or uh, if you can see the signs of ectopic pregnancy like uh, a bagel sign i will discuss about the bagel sign don't worry see presence of the bagel sign or presence of a fetal a cardiac activity in the adnexal the diagnosis of ectopic is confirmed so simple in the uterine cavity there is no pregnancy if you have searched the adnexa if you can find fetal cardiac activity or if you can find the signs of ectopic pregnancy in adnexa diagnosis of ectopic is confirmed but when comes the problem see you have checked the uterus there inside the uterus there is no g sac after that you have searched adnexa also even in the adnexa there is no fetal cardiac activity or no bagel sign now what is the cause for the urine pregnancy test to be coming positive so please concentrate in adnexa also fetal cardiac activity is not seen and even in uterus also g sac is not seen now why urine pregnancy test is coming positive if urine pregnancy test is coming positive definitely there is this pregnancy you are unable to locate in the uterus you are unable to locate in the adnexa now the possibilities are see the one possibility might be an abortion okay abortion happened that's the reason why you are unable to locate in the uterus or you unable to locate in the adnexa or it can still be an ectopic but you are unable to find it okay ectopic can be there in the ovaries in the fallopian tubes it can be like you know in the abdomen somewhere 
there is a ectopic you are unable to found it on the ultrasonography why because ultrasonography is operator dependent you should be more experienced to localize that now or it can be early intrauterine pregnancy guys in early intrauterine pregnancy the g sac cannot be visualized in the uterine cavity guys please concentrate if this is a uterus in early intrauterine pregnancy there is this very small g sac which can't be picked up by the transvaginal sonography okay so what are the possibilities urine pregnancy test is coming positive inside the uterus there is no baby or i should say inside the uterus there is no g sac in the adnex also no cardiac activity the possibilities are there might be a, a, like you no know, abortion have happened or still it is an ectopic pregnancy or it is early intrauterine pregnancy now how to differentiate between these three possibilities now what you are going to do now is very important thing you are going to measure beta hcg levels okay why beta hcg levels are important why because there is this very important concept see at 1500 international units okay at 1500 international units of beta hcg okay at this value it is 100% sure that you should be able to localize g sac in transvaginal sonography okay at this much value guys at this much value of beta hcg you should be able to localize g sac in transvaginal sonography this is known as a critical titer value of beta hcg okay or if you are doing trans abdominal sonography at 5000 to 6000 international units you should be able to localize g sac in the in uterine cavity now now see see you have measured the beta hcg values let's discuss about this side first okay i hope you can still see it beta hcg values are more than 1500 okay you have ordered for the beta hcg beta hcg values are more than 1500 but inside the uterus you are unable to localize the g sac what is the concept at 1500 international units of beta hcg on transvaginal sonography you should be able to localize g sac but in our condition beta hcg values are more than 1500 but uterus is empty it is 100% confirm that this is a case of ectopic go and search the adnexa properly now if beta hcg values are less than 1500 what to do repeat after 48 hours okay repeat the beta hcg value after 48 hours now let me tell you one concept in a normal okay normal intra uterine pregnancy there is this concept known as khadar's principle where beta hcg values will doubles okay will doubles for every 48 hours okay for every 48 hours in a normal pregnancy if it is a normal pregnancy beta hcg values doubles up doubles up in the sense it's not going to exactly double by 100% at least 66% increase will be there okay now beta hcg values are less than 1500 international units you have repeated after 48 hours now after 48 hours if beta hcg values are falling down okay if it's falling down it's a case of abortion okay if beta hcg values is doubling okay according to kadar's principle for every 48 hours in the early pregnancy it doubles beta hcg value doubles so it is early intrauterine pregnancy you have to wait certain time to see the g sac under normal transvaginal sonography it's a intrauterine pregnancy early intrauterine pregnancy see increasing okay beta hcg values are increasing but not doubling up if it's not doubling up for 48 hours this is not normal pregnancy this is ectopic pregnancy if it is a normal pregnancy it doubles up here increasing but not doubling so this is ectopic pregnancy okay this is how we are going to put the diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy if it is unruptured okay unruptured ectopic pregnancy this is the diagnostic protocol now after this see uh, let's talk about a few important signs in a normal intrauterine pregnancy we are talking about the g sac right if it is a true g sac there is something called as pseudo g sac also 
what i am mainly focusing on is signs of a true g sac or signs of a true intrauterine pregnancy guys there are two signs known as intradecidual sign and double decidual sign what exactly intradecidual sign please concentrate see here is the embryo okay gestational sac or the embryo now embryo is it getting implanted into the endometrium or not yes definitely see this embryo is getting totally surrounded by the endometrium the endometrium of pregnancy is known as a decidua we all know it the endometrium of pregnancy is decidua now this embryo is getting embedded in the decidua totally covered by the decidua decidua parietalis decidua basalis and decidua capsularis so can i call it as intra decidual the sac is intra decidual totally covered by the decidua so intra decidual sign g sac completely enclosed by the decidua it's a true gestational sac it's a true pregnancy now there is this one more sign called as a double decidual sign what exactly is this double decidual sign let me uh, make the concept more clear for example what you are seeing is a g sac this is a g sac now see this area okay this area of endometrium is nothing but the decidua basalis okay that's the base decidua basalis this area is the decidua capsularis and the remaining endometrium or the remaining decidua is the decidua parietalis we all know that now please concentrate the decidua capsularis this area okay decidua capsularis this is one layer of decidua and here is the decidua parietalis okay this is one layer of decidua are they coming close to each other or not yes as the embryo is growing the decidua parietalis and decidua capsularis they are approximating each other okay they are approximating each other in in between them there is this endometrial cavity which is filled with the endometrial fluids so what i'm saying is here is one layer of decidua this is one layer of decidua and here is our embryo so it causes a double decidual sign so double decidual means decidua capsularis and decidua parietalis okay they are going to create this double decidual sign okay double decidual sign and intra decidual sign they are the signs of a true g sac now after this let's talk about blob sign or bagel sign what exactly is this blob sign or bagel sign blob sign or bagel sign is seen in ectopic pregnancies okay these are the signs of ectopic pregnancy in the adnexal region see here you are having this g sac this is not in the uterus there is this g sac in the adnexa it is surrounded by a hyper echoic ring g sac surrounded by a hyper echoic ring in a adnexal region is known as blob sign or a bagel sign okay which is seen in ectopic pregnancy now after this what we have to do see if ectopic pregnancy is ruptured what is the only management salpingectomy via laparotomy that's the only surgery of choice if it is unruptured if patient is hemodynamically stable now she is stable now she is having unruptured ectopic pregnancy what to do we can try medical management okay so medical management means you are going to give a drug and what is the drug methotrexate okay this one drug is enough to treat ectopic pregnancy this is a medical management for doing medical management there are certain criteria what are they first of all pa patient should be hemodynamically stable okay hemodynamically stable means she is not having ruptured ectopic if there is a ruptured ectopic definitely she will be in shock hemodynamically stable patient and the beta hcg value should be also be less than 500 international units per ml which means less beta hcg less beta hcg means small ectopic early ectopic so that you can try medical management no fetal cardiac activity on ultrasonography if there is no fetal cardiac activity this ectopic is already dead it's not growing so you can try medical management okay with this drugs already the ectopic is gone so with this drugs you can treat her ectopic mass less than 3 to 4 cm means small ectopics can be easily managed with medical management and the patient is also not having pain or she is having milder pain not severe pain okay so these are the indications for medical management but in certain cases you are not supposed to do medical management 
So what are those certain cases? Means contraindications of medical management. For example, if there is a ruptured ectopic pregnancy or hemodynamically unstable patient, go with the salpingectomy. If there is a viable intrauterine pregnancy, don't give methotrexate. Why? Because it can kill the baby. Hypersensitivity to methotrexate. Okay, now she is having drug reactions. Now she is having this hypersensitivity reaction to methotrexate. A drug allergy for methotrexate. Don't give it. Okay, if she is a breastfeeding female, don't give methotrexate. If she is having any immunodeficiency conditions, don't give methotrexate. Why? Because methotrexate itself is a potent immunosuppressant. Uh, if she is having pulmonary TB, okay, pulmonary diseases like TB, don't give methotrexate. Why? Because methotrexate will cause pulmonary toxicity. In peptic ulcer disease, because methotrexate can cause mucositis and it can increase the severity of peptic ulcer disease. So, these are the contraindications for medical management of ectopic pregnancy. So, at the end of the day, the important point I want to put into your mind is if you want to do medical management, everything should be safer. Okay, there shouldn't be any complications. Patient is hemodynamically stable, small ectopic size is seen, uh, no fetal cardiac activity is seen. Okay, if everything is okay, you can go with the medical management. Now, what exactly we are doing in the medical management? The one thing we know is we will give methotrexate. How much amount of methotrexate? How many times we are going to give? See that we will discuss here. There is this uh, very uh, famous protocol called as a single dose protocol where we are giving methotrexate for one time. Okay, one time methotrexate enough to treat unruptured ectopic. What we are doing on day one, day one means the first day you are giving the methotrexate. On day one, you are giving 50 milligram per meter square body surface area. Okay, this much amount of methotrexate was given or 1 milligram per kg. Okay, 1 milligram per kg of the female. If she is 70 kg, 70 milligram, something like that. Okay, so 1 milligram per kg via intramuscular route of methotrexate was given. Send her home. Now, ask her to come on day 4. Okay, first day, second day, third day. Now, ask her to come on day 4. Now, what you have to do? Simply check the beta HCG values and again send her home. Okay, check beta HCG values, send her home. Ask her to come on day 7th. Check her beta HCG values. Now, compare the beta HCG values on day 4 and day 7. Okay, you have taken the beta HCG value on day 4, right? So, you are comparing the beta HCG value between day 4 and day 7. If your treatment is working, what should happen? Beta HCG value should be coming down. Right? So, if beta HCG levels are declining more than 15% between day 4 and day 7, your treatment is working excellently. You no need to do anything. You no need to give any drug further. Simply monitor the patient. Okay? Ask her to come on a regular basis. You just simply check the beta HCG values till the time it comes to normal. Okay? Zero. But what if... The decline is less than 15% from day 4 to day 7. If the decline is less than 15%, again restart the treatment. Again give her methotrexate. Okay, same dose of methotrexate is given again. You can do like this for 3 cycles. Okay, you can do this for maximum of 3 times. But still the beta HCG values are not coming down. If beta HCG values are not coming down means... Your treatment, your medical management is not able to like you know, solve the issue. Your medical management is not enough. So what to do now? Go with the surgical management. Okay guys, now in single dose protocol, what we are doing? We are giving methotrexate. How much amount of methotrexate we are giving? 50 milligram per meter square body surface area for one time. Send her home. Ask her to come on day 4, day 7. Compare between day 4, day 7. If decline is more than 50%, everything is good. If not, repeat the treatment. How many times you can do this? You can do it for 3 times maximum. But even after 3 times, if beta HCG values are not falling down, what you can do is medical, uh, surgical management. Now, in surgical management, they will ask you, if family is completed, what to do? If family is not completed, what to do? Guys, please concentrate. If a family is not completed, Okay, there is this female, you are trying this uh, uh, medical management. This medical management was not successful. 
Now, if her family is not completed, what you can do is solping gauze to me. Okay, you are going to a given incision to the fallopian tubes. You have removed the ectopic and don't put the sutures. You are not going to keep the sutures. Simply leave it alone. It will heal by itself. That is solping gostomy where sutures are not placed. If family is not completed, solping gostomy is best. If family is completed, then you can go simply do salpingectomy. Take out the tube, throw it out. Okay. Salpingectomy, family is completed. Salping gostomy, if family is not completed. Okay, now you can also try salping gotomy. Salping gotomy means you, you have given the infusion, uh, incision, you have taken out the ectopic, you have sutured it. If you sutured it, it is salping gotomy. No suture, salping gostomy. Salping gostomy is best. Okay, you can also try segmental resection and reanastomosis. So that part of fallopian tube was removed. Okay, wherever the ectopic is there, that part of fallopian tube is removed and the two parts are joined again. That is the segmental resection, reanastomosis and milking of the tubes. These are all the old techniques which you are, you are not usually doing. So, best thing if family is not completed is salping ostomy. If family is completed, salping jectomy. Okay, this is the surgical management. Now, after this, here what you are seeing is a heterotropic pregnancy. This is the uterus. Inside the uterus, you can see one pregnancy. Outside the uterus, there is a one more a G sac. Okay, so G sac with the G sac with the hyper echo occurring. This is a heterotropic pregnancy. One intrauterine, one ectopic. Okay, now what exactly is lithopedion? Lithos means lithos means stone. Pedions means baby. So it's a stone baby. The term actually describes stone baby. Actually, this type of stone babies are seen with the abdominal pregnancies. See, there is this abdominal ectopic. This ectopic got aborted. Now, the maternal body is unable to resorb all this ectopic baby. So, what happens? This dead baby got calcified. Okay. Now, this dead baby was found incidentally after a long time when this mother gone to ultrasonography. Okay. She also doesn't know that she is carrying this a stone baby. Okay. Incidentally, after a long time, whenever she had this ultrasonography, there she is seeing this mass. Okay. Calcium mass. So, this is lithopedion, which is usually seen with the abdominal ectopic. For example, if ectopic is too large to reabsorb by the maternal body, it get calcifies, okay, outside causing a stone baby. That is the lithopedion. Okay, guys, we have completed all the important points regarding ectopic pregnancy. Like, you know, a diagnosis, a management, okay, everything about ectopic pregnancy is completed. Hope uh, you have a better understanding of the ectopic pregnancy. Hope the video is helpful. Thank you.